Well, it's good to be here this morning and to share with you. And uh, I thought about it. I thought, you know, they thought, oh, he's not going to turn up again. Twice, I think it was, that I was booked. And something came up each time, and uh, I wasn't able to come. But it did work out this time. So I'm glad to be here this morning. When Tom asked me about the service this morning, I said, well, I realize that's in the Easter time, and, and uh, I didn't want to cut into what he was preparing for. So I said I would perhaps use a general theme, uh, simply the cross of Christ. And uh, I realized that uh, this is not, it's going to cover a fairly big area. Maybe it's bigger than we uh, anticipate. But uh, I want to share with you this morning some of the things about the cross of Christ that I think are essential for us to, uh, to know and to experience. And the, the um, scriptures which uh, were read for us this morning by Lucy, uh, the portion from uh, Romans uh, chapter um, 6 uh, will be the portion which I'm going to be basing a number of the uh, thoughts on this morning. And I would also suggest that if you want to find something that answers a lot of questions about this season of the year, the Easter season, read Romans. Romans, especially Romans chapter 6, because you find that there's something in there that I, I want to draw a little bit out of it this morning, but we won't be able to take too much out of it. Before we go to that, let me share with you a couple illustrations that I think help us to understand a little bit clearer about it. It's actually Easter from a little boy's viewpoint. The story was told about a little boy who wandered from his home, couldn't find his way back, and uh, we're not told what it was that distracted him, but obviously as he was walking away from home, he may have been following a butterfly. It would have just kept him going, and he just followed it wherever it went. Where did I? Where did I turn? Where did I not turn? And so, you know how that that happens sometimes. It may have been something else that he was following, but it seemed as though that he was attracted to something that took him away, and he couldn't find his way back home. And you know what a child looks like when they realize all of a sudden, I'm not home and I don't know how to get there. What do I do? Some children have a way, like adults, of hiding their feelings and their emotions and so on. And I've seen children just react in a, in a totally uh, un, unprepared manner uh, when, when something of this nature happens to them. I'm not sure how this little guy was managing all of this, but as he was uh, at that point, he he had apparently stopped. Some bypassers noticed that he was seemed to be lost, and they begin to ask him some questions <clears throat> uh, to find out how that they could get him back to his home. They ask him, "Do you know your home address?" Well, he was only small, and uh, the little boy didn't know it. Next, they ask him, "Do you know what your house looks like?" And the little boy responded with uh, no details other than saying, "Well, it was just white." So apparently they stood for a few moments, and all of a sudden uh, they ask again, can you tell us what your dad's name, or what your father's name is? And the little boy answered, Daddy. <laughs> And they realized that they were sort of at the end of themselves. What do we do to help this child to find their way back home? He seemed to be unable to assist them in, in any of the ways which they had asked him and uh, uh, give them any important details. Um, but then all of a sudden the little boy said, near my home is a beautiful building that has a cross on it. And he said to them, he said, if you show me the cross, then I'll find my way home. If you show me the cross, I know where my home is from that cross. We realize that all of us focus on the cross at various times and... Uh, Having the TV on this morning, when I came upstairs after doing a little preparation, my wife was watching something, and the debate was on there, you know, how that in Quebec they're going to take, and I'm not saying I'm with it or against it or whatever, but apparently the, the, the thought was brought up that, okay, anybody wearing a cross can't do that at work anymore, uh, that you daren't do that kind of a thing. 
And I realize that the cross of Jesus Christ is being sort of put aside. But you know, when you look at the scripture and you think about our own Christian experiences in life, we realize the cross is very central to what the Bible teaches us about as believers. We see how Jesus took our place and suffered and died on the cross and to give us eternal life. And apart from Jesus, his saving work on the cross, there's no way to find our way home. Now, let me tell you the viewpoint, or, or, or the Easter from the viewpoint of an adult. And this person I know very well, and they shared the story with me. And they were telling me how that uh, they had lived with the uh, parents, apparently, and I'm, I'm thinking the father was still living. But his mother took very sick and, and ill, and she was taken to St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg. You can picture that, where that is, and so on, over in there. Uh, is they took her to the hospital there and he said I was very disturbed I was I was really I was really having a difficult time in letting go of her because she had meant so much to him in his life and he shared with how that he struggled with all of this and he was there and I'm not sure whether it was in her room but he looked out the window and on St. Boniface Hospital, there's a cross. I don't know whether it's still there or not. I began thinking about that. I wondered, have they made them take it down? It's, it's a symbol, you know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just raising the question. He said, I looked out the window and I saw this cross. And he said, I stood there and I looked at it with all of these emotions in me, with letting go of my mother and, and releasing her to death. And, and he said, I was struggling deeply with it. He said, there was an audible voice, but he said it was a voice that came to me and said from the cross, it's okay, everything is going to be all right. And he said, when I heard that within myself, and he said it wasn't an audible voice, it just came as a message as I looked at the cross. It's going to be okay, she'll be, it's okay, it's fine. He said, there was a peace came over me, and he said, my whole emotions changed. The feeling of, of losing her or releasing her, all that I've been struggling with. He said, all of that changed, and, and it, was, it was different. And he said, I went on, and he said, uh, my mother passed away. He said, we had the funeral. And he said, actually, to me, it was a celebration. It wasn't a time of sorrow because he said she was ready to go. She knew that where she was going. And he said, from the cross came the message that simply said, it'll be okay. Everything is all right. From a perspective as a child, show me the cross and I can find my home. From a perspective of an adult, show me the cross and I hear the voice of Jesus saying, it's okay. I'll help you through this and how the emotions all change so drastically, so completely and entirely uh, as the individual face that. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Now, I know that there's a whole, and it would take us a good long while just to take that apart and see what it is that he's really saying to us. But in simple terms, it's this. Access to God begins with the shedding of Jesus' blood. The laying down of his life as a payment for the penalty for our sin. And as far in life as we have gone, we have thought about this many times. We've gone through many services. But I'm wondering how many of us have really captured the message of the cross in our walk with God and experiencing the things of God. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is the indispensable. It is the absolutely necessary for us to know God. What if we lost the cross? What if they were forbidding us that we can't no longer use it as a, as a symbol when we're outside of our place of worship or, or so on? What does the cross mean to us? What does the cross mean to you this morning? There's three things I want to leave with you this morning to think about. 
And, and, and until we understand, I think, these three things, we really can't appropriate or apply the message of the cross in our own lives until we understand it. We can't really say, yes, I believe it, that this is what it means to me as an individual. Firstly, the cross of Christ is substitutionary. You know what that means. It means that uh, to take the place of another. Substitutionary. In other words, the cross of Christ took the place of what we didn't have to offer to God for our sin. We had nothing. We had broken the law of God. Sin had violated the will of God and the ways of God. And there was no payment which we could bring to satisfy God with that. And at that particular point, I remember talking about this to a group of individuals who we were together with. And I remember how that, as I was talking about this, how that when this individual realized God did something he didn't have to do, God did something we couldn't do. God did something that changed everything. And the person said, wow, he must love us. He must love us. And I said, he does. He loves us beyond what we can even comprehend or imagine. It was our death, Christ died, and our penalty that he incurred. Not for himself, because he had no sin. It was for us. Can you think of someone loving you and I enough to do that? To put themselves in a place where they would sacrifice their very life, their very being, for us as individuals. And this is what we see God doing in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, we stand responsible and guilty of sin. We owe God, and we can give God nothing for it, in repentance for it, uh, because there's no payment we can make that is possible to be able to atone for it. Jesus paid it in full. He stepped into our place. He took our place, and he fulfilled that for us. As a consequence or a result of our repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ, we become indwelled by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I wonder how often we stop and think about that. God, by His Spirit, lives inside of us. Hmm. We realize that all of this comes about because, as he says there, he says, we, when Christ was on the cross, we were brought into union with him. And what happened to him, he was doing for us so that when the time came, we could be able to be reconciled and be made the children of God. And I, I realize that just casually thinking about this is not, not really beginning to grip our hearts in the way uh, which we really find that it can. We become indwelt by His Spirit. We realize that, that that oneness with God, because as someone said, when Jesus was on the cross, God saw you there with Him. Because that's why he was there. A substitutionary. We had no, no offering which was adequate or, or sufficient. And, and, and it was that which he was doing on our behalf. We realize that, that uh, uh, we, we, we may not be a debtor to God in, in, in many ways because we have nothing with which to pay for, but we are indeed indebted to God for his gracious love and goodness to us substitutionary, the cross. On it was the Christ who is giving himself for us. For in him, when he died, God sees you and I. Secondly, the cross of Christ is satisfactory. Satisfactory. What do we mean by that? God requires nothing more. And oh, how people struggle with this. 
You know, surely there's something more I have to do to be forgiven. Surely there's something I have to, you know, bring upon myself. Some kind of punishment, some kind of, of um, difficulty or pain should be inflicted, inflicted on me so that God can accept me. We're actually missing the point totally when we look at it in that way because we realize that he has done what is sufficient, it is satisfactory, and God requires no more. We realize that this thought of, and I think about a man who I visited many years ago in the hospital, 97 years of age. He had walked with God. He had served in the church. He had taught Sunday school. He had helped and he had worked hard in, in the Christian faith. But he came to that point in the hospital while he was there and he was 97. And he said, what do I have to do yet so that God can accept me? <laughs> Finally, we got through to him. You don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it all. It's him and him alone that makes the difference. Someone said, yes, we may feel better when we punish ourselves for it. And we say, that'll really improve our relationship with God when it really doesn't. Someone said, you may walk around the block ten times with gravel in your shoes and have your feet bleeding. But that doesn't improve your relationship to God. You know, inflicting, and, and we sort of have this mentality that, you know, yes, Jesus died on the cross. But I've got to add something to that. I've got to do something more than that. No. It's his sacrifice is satisfactory. And God says that's enough. It's paid. It's paid in full. And then there's the third thing which I, I want to share with you. And that is that the cross of Christ is sufficient. And I think about the individual who says, well, I have committed sin beyond what I even want to talk about or what I want to even think about. And God can't forgive that. God can't forgive that. In other words, they feel that the, the depth of their depravity, their evil, is so deep that the blood of Christ cannot atone. But it isn't. There is no sin which you or I have committed. And I realize that you need to understand what I'm talking about here. And I realize there's the, 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 the unpardonable sin. And we're not talking about that at this particular point. There is no sin which you have committed that you are aware of that is disturbing you. That is beyond the forgiveness of God. Like the person years ago... Tabor home, person in a bed, coming about this high off the board, bed with pain, just simply lifting themselves off the bed. And, and I remember the doctor who, if I mentioned his name, you would know him, he's a Christian, and he left a note and he said, so-and-so's problem is not physical, it's spiritual, I think. He said, would you check it out? Went in and I pulled the chair up beside the bed of the individual and I sat down and I began to talk to them and they were in pain, such terrible pain. And, and I remember how that, how that they were struggling with this and finally, I said, don't tell me more than you want me to know, but share with me what it is that's really bothering you. Finally, the person said, when I was a younger person, something happened in my life and I have never told anybody. I said, your family? No, I have never told anybody. You're the first person that I have ever told this to. And I said, only share what you want. Something happened, and I lived with the guilt of it. She was a Sunday school teacher. She was a radiant, you know, person. And she struggled deeply within it. And, and she said, I, I committed this. And I said, she said, I have never been able to re accept God's forgiveness. Well, we know when you do that. 
your Christian life is one in which God is strange and you don't always enjoy the times you spend with him because you're thinking of what you did and you're thinking he might find out. Well, he already does know, you know, we, we can't. Anyhow, we talked about it and, and, and I knew that she knew the scripture and I said to her, I said, what would you tell somebody else? Well, she said these were the scriptures and, and, and I said, well, if that don't work for them, why won't it work for you? And she said, that's the problem. I can believe that everybody else in the world can be forgiven, but not me. And you know, it was at that point where we finally broke through and she said, I do believe that God can forgive and that he does forgive. And you know, she lay on the bed and didn't bounce off the bed in pain. She reached her hand out through the railing because they had the, the railings up, otherwise she'd have been out of there on the floor. She reached out through the railing and she said, took my hand, and she said, you know, in 75 years I've never felt like this before. I feel forgiven. I feel forgiven. You know, she struggled all those years and I'm thinking God's provision is sufficient. There is no sin too great for God to forgive. I thought about the story of, the, of an individual who, a lady, who just a few years ago, and I didn't even remember her name, I don't, she was in prison, I believe she had committed murder, uh, and she'd become a Christian, and, and how that, uh, and I don't know what her name is, but I, I, she went through all of this, and how that she, she accepted forgiveness from God, and how that she became such a witness, even to the point of walking to her death, she was still praising God that his sufficient, his provision was adequate. I want you to see this morning, whatever it is in life that you may be struggling with, we all struggle with things, that God's provision at the cross of Calvary is sufficient to cover it all. It's sufficient to cover it completely. Because without the confidence that we stand justified before God solely on the basis of the death of Christ and his resurrection, we can't really enjoy God and know God and in share in his presence. The cross of Jesus is the starting point and it's God's remarkable gift to us that means that by which we may have access to God. You know how a child feels when they want to go to their parents and they've violated something and they know that it's wrong? Oh, you know, just a terrible time. And sometimes we struggle with that relationship with God. The cross gives us an access to God that gives us freedom to be his child. And you can tell him anything. He already knows it. You can ask him for anything, but above all, believe that he really loves you enough that his sacrifice of his son on the cross was substitutionary. We had nothing. It was satisfactory. God accepted it. And it is sufficient for whatever you deal with in life. And you can be forgiven and enjoy the presence of God. Someone put it in this way. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me and then giving me your life, the only means of having access to God and being reconciled to him. <laughs> that to me is what the cross means this morning. It means that life changes, life is different. And that the presence and peace of God can fill our hearts. Yes, there'll be bumps in the road. There'll be difficult places. There'll be things which we won't always understand when we face them and go through them. But God is with us. And he loves us so much that he went to the cross in the person of Jesus. That we can be his children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this Easter season. What a wonderful time. What a time to remember that, God, you love us. 
sometimes, Lord, we realize that we get struggling and the enemy would like to cause us to feel that, oh, we just can't be loved by God. We're not good enough. We haven't done enough and all of these kinds of things. But, oh, God, I pray that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guide and overshadow and direct. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Amen.